Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host, Jo Milmine, and this is episode 165, Getting Rid of Moths in Knitwear. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's all right. I need a drink, I need a friend, I need your help. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 165 of the Shalabies podcast. Hello, I'm Jo, I'm your host, and today is Tuesday, the 24th of November 2020. How are you? I hope you're well since last time I spoke to you. And this week I've got, yeah, a bit of a mixed bag of a week for you. The main topic of today's show is going to be getting rid of moths from knitwear. And there's a reason for that. As you know, I like to use my general experiences in the world as content fodder for the podcast. And yeah, there's a reason why this is today's episode. But before that, I've got some other little bits of chit chat that we want to get into. So grab a brew, grab your knitting and we will crack on with the show. So, hello. Yeah, as I said, this past week has... Well, I've not said, have I? I haven't said this past week has been a bit of a shocker, but this past week has been a bit of a shocker. A little bit dreadful. So my little doggy, one ball, apple of my eye, my little favourite, my Shetland sheepdog, is 13. So he's an old boy now. And he has been on the podcast before. If you've listened to the whole back catalogue, you will have heard him in the years past. Generally, it involves him doing a bit of a groan when he's decided he doesn't like what I have to say on the podcast. So he understands everything that's going on. He's a very trusted advisor. And although he pretends he is deaf these days, he actually 100% follows what is happening. And if he dislikes what he hears with his sheepdog hearing, then he will... Grumble, usually in that manner. So he will groan his disappointment or his disdain, or whenever he feels like he needs to groan at you, he will he will groan, he will huff, he will do all of the things. And bless him, he's been really quite unwell, quite an unwell doggy, and he's never been sick before. So I'm not that equipped to deal with it, quite frankly. And he's been in the vets for three days on a drip, on an IV all day because he's it turns out he's got kidney disease which is bad obviously and um because he's quite stoic you know and he he's really beautiful he's a very very beautiful dog and i know everybody says that about my dog but he is really pretty to the point where everyone thinks he's a girl again eliciting massive groans having none of that and he's just been um a little bit kind of sad, a bit lethargic and he's had an upset tummy and all of that good stuff. I've been puking behind the coach, like, do please don't puke behind the coach, which is not very him. And they weren't just like, they said, well, maybe it could be this, maybe it could be that. We could try this. And I said, just give him a blood test, find out what's up with him. Like, I don't want to play this like, you know, guessing game. Like, let's just figure out what's wrong with him and get it dealt with. So... Yeah, 700 quid later, he's still got kidney disease. So it's been a little bit stressful having to like organise everything to drop the kids off, then drop him off at the vets and then come back and then pick the kids up and pick him up, then come back. And he was really, really not good during the middle of the week. And I was quite concerned that, you know, the writing might be on the wall. The good news is, is it, it doesn't appear to be just yet. Touch wood. Um... And he appears to have picked up and he's, he's back to eating food and snorkeling. Snorkeling being the verb for the thing that dogs do underneath the table where the kids have been eating. Or just in general, they snorkel around the kitchen looking for little bits of crumbs to eat. So he's back to his snorkeling ways. So I'm hoping that's that's a positive sign. But he's an old boy now. 
And we never really quite want to face that day, do we? And I, I was in Norway, ready to face that earlier in the week. And I'm still not, quite frankly. But yeah, so pretty difficult week. Yeah, all told. Emotionally quite draining. I can deal with everything 2020 wants to chuck at me. I'm pretty hardcore. I've done some stuff, you know. I can cope with being locked up on my own my kids for six months. Whatever, whatever, you know. All of that stuff, COVID, blah, me, don't care. Just mess with my dogs, that's it. I'm I'm not that I'm I'm you know, I'm tapping out at that one. That's just not something I'm prepared to do. So didn't get much knitting done, didn't get much work done, got an awful lot of worrying done, and an awful lot of Dr. Google done. And the crowning turd on my steaming pile of poo of a week was going to my cupboard the other day, my wardrobe, and it was it was a bit chilly. It was quite cold, even though the heating was on. I don't live in a cold house. It's a, it's a new build. It's quite efficient, and it's not a cold house. Um, but I was just feeling a bit cold. And I do suffer from the cold a little bit. That's why I'm a knitter. And I thought, oh, I'll just put this merino base layer on that I got from Aldi. It's that nice little grey merino base layer for skiing. I've never been skiing on snow, but I'm going to wear the base layer because it's made of, of sheep. And I put it on, it's like all grey and it had these neon pink, you know, overlocked stitches on it. I'm like, oh, I'm so cosy. This is so nice, blah, blah, blah. And then I noticed on my watch hand, there was two little holes where, where your watch goes. I was like, oh, I must have just caught that on like my watch or I've got, I've got a baby G, there's no sharp edges on it, but this eluded me at this point. Like I said, hashtag tough week. Or maybe I caught, you know, maybe I must have caught it on like um like the Velcro or my, you know, my jacket or something, you know. Yeah. And carried on through the rest of my day. And it was only later on when I was on a call on Zoom with um, a couple of my friends doing a business call and noticed the other arm had a couple of holes in it, which point the O caption started to illuminate. But it came on full up purple alert when I went to scratch my back and put my fingers straight through a hole on the back of the top that I hadn't realised was there because it was on the back. And subsequent inspection of said merino garment revealed that something had been making Swiss cheese of it. Yeah. So... It, it was at the bottom of the pile and I did have the whole pile out a few months ago to, to reorganise it all and throw a load of stuff away. But effectively, there is something in my wardrobe eating my stuff and my actual knitwear lives on, t on that pile of stuff. So the good news is, there is some good news, is it's not my stash cupboard. My stash cupboard is in an entirely different room. Everything is boxed up in there. Nothing sits on the floor. Like it would be very difficult for any munchy things to get in there unless I actually put them in there. It's quite all boxed in. So it'd be very difficult. Unless it came in on some yarn, you wouldn't get anything in there. So that that's good, right? That's good, good news. There's nothing in my carpets because of plastic. Not my choice. That's what came with the house. But quite useful at this point. But in the bottom of that wardrobe, there is definitely something. Now, I hadn't noticed it when I pulled everything out before, so I'm assuming whatever it was came in with some stuff that was brought back from China in summer. And maybe that's where they came from. I'm not 100% sure. But there is something eating them, and I'm not convinced it was from my old Victorian house. I think I would have probably noticed before now. Although I can't remember the last time I wore it. And this is part of the problem. So yeah, breathe, breathe. Sorry, if you've stopped breathing, because some of you will have at this point, it's okay. Respirate, it's fine. Um, I'm dealing with it. I'm dealing with it. And it's not a super old host that is going to have like moth problems forever, which is the good news. And these things were stored on the bottom of the wardrobe, which is a carpet, it's built in wardrobe. So there are things that can be done. But I thought, seeing as I'm suffering, 
you don't need to. Like, I'll go figure out how we're going to get rid of these critters and I will share that with you today. So that is why we are talking about getting rid of moths in knitwear. So in true Shana Beast tradition, we've got a pattern for you to go with the, this, this summing up this week and the, the entire year, frankly. And if that dog kicks the bucket before the end of the year, I am out, I'm telling you. But the pattern I've got for you is Dumpster Fire 2020 by Kino Knits because it just summed up everything that was going on with my week last week. Six US dollars. And half of all of the proceeds will go to the Anne Arundel County Food Bank for that. I will put a link to it in the show notes, but it's a little Christmas decoration of a little dumpster that's on fire. And you can knit all the bits, sew it all up, and you've got a dumpster fire for your tree. How exciting. How exciting. So, yes, basically, we're going to be talking about how to deal with moths chewing your knitwear. Now, I've again jumped to a bit of a conclusion here and assumed it is moths because there are some carpet beetles that can chew knitwear. And I do have carpets in there. However, I'm going to take it that it's not that and more likely to be moths instead. But I'll let you know when I've, I've, I've deployed all of the things that I've collected in anger to deal with this particular situation. So hopefully you are a person that's never had a moth chew any of your stuff. That would be ideal. But for most of us, especially in the UK, we're probably going to have had it. And in a lot of other countries as well, moths are a bit of a perennial problem when it comes to the beautiful knitwear. And I know lots and lots of people who have had stuff chewed by moths before. Now, the reason moths chew your knitwear is because they feed on a protein called keratin, which is found in natural fibres like wool and silk. They love cashmere. They like a bit of alpaca. Um, But they'll also, disgusting little creatures that they are, chew on any food residues, any bodily secretions, any like little sweaty patches, um, dead skin, like dust, human hair, dander from pets, soil, like all of those delicious things that you have floating around your house, no matter how many times you hammer the Dyson, you know, cat and dog, whatever, it's going to happen. So in the UK, we have, excuse the sound of pages turning because I don't want to press pause. I just want to carry on talking. In the UK, we have two different kinds, two different kinds of moth that chew clothes. Okay. So the first one we have is called a case bearing moth, right? They've been in the UK since Roman times, apparently. And they can live outside. So they found case bearing moths in birds' nests and they will eat like birds' feathers and dander from birds and things like that. So that's, that's a, you know, a place they would go to eat them. We also have another kind of moth though in the UK called the webbing clothes moth. That was first discussed and talked about in Victorian times. And the theory is that that moth was imported from South Africa because in Victorian times we were importing a lot of feather products and a lot of skin products. And that is the way that that particular moth tends to get around. Um, They don't survive outside, but they do absolutely love living in our nice, centrally heated, cosy, warm, modern houses. So that's why they're a little bit of a problem. And there used to be a chemical that was used in mothballs um, that was banned in 2008 because it's quite toxic and since then there's been a steady increase in the incidence of moth infestation. There is a variety of ways that you can get rid of it but these problems are not really going to go away when it comes to moths. Now according to English Heritage who've done a study of moth traps used at their properties. English Heritage, if you are not in the UK or you're not familiar, is an organisation that is similar to the National Trust and its function is to preserve historical houses and historical artefacts and kind of for the benefit of everyone. So it's not in the National Trust. English Heritage is a separate organisation and you can join and you can go look around all these big old country houses and look at all of their historical artefacts and they are there to preserve the 
heritage. And they have done a study of moth traps that are used at their properties because it's like a full-time job in their properties to keep the moths away because they're all very old houses, full of very old stuff. And they found a 216% increase in the number of webbing clothes moths caught between 2012 and 2016. Now, we had a really mild winter and spring came quite early. If you remember, we were all in lockdown. It's been going on forever, but it was really hot. So everyone was loving it initially because everyone's in the back garden, you know, painting the fences, getting a suntan and all that kind of good stuff. But the reason why the moths are also spreading is one, we got rid of one of the main chemicals that controlled them, but it was nasty stuff. So it was a good idea, but that means that chemical isn't controlling them anymore. We've got warmer winters, we've got central heating, and we have a lot more clothes that we own, but we don't wear them as often. And one of the things um, that I'll talk about in a little bit for getting rid of the moths or controlling the moths is to disturb them often and to have your clothes in and out more often so that if there is any damage, you catch it earlier on rather than at the point where there's actual holes in it. Now, the top that I got chewed, it's very fine machine stitch merino so it doesn't take a lot of chewing to get through it in absolute fairness um but obviously this you know things like cashmere's are fine gauge wools generally even in a knitted garment if it's a commercial garment it will be generally a fine gauge wool so you don't want to be finding out that they've chewed it when you come to wear it at the you know start of winter so the first step to getting rid of the little buggers or stopping them even coming in in the first place, is cleanliness. No, I'm not a complete minger. I do clean up, right? I've got a cleaner as well who helps me clean up. So, you know, it is clean and I've got dogs. So I'm always hoovering the carpets. I've got a decent hoover. Like I'm, I'm always like on top of that. Um, But dust just gets in your you don't go and hoover your the bottom of your wardrobe 50 times a day like you don't do it you don't even do it every week I hoovered it out when I sorted all those clothes out back in sort of April and threw a load of stuff out and threw a lot of shoes out that's when I was last in there and I, and I hoovered it all out then because I like to have a nice clean kind of surface for them to go on now ideally I wouldn't have stuff laying on the floor but I don't have enough shelves in my wardrobe because the other wardrobe that has got shelves in is full of yarn the yarn's safe the good news is but the main way to get rid of them is just to starve them out they if they've got no food they're not going to be there basically they're not going to survive so the main thing is to get in there get everything out and clean all of it so only put clean stuff back in your wardrobe and I'm murdered for doing this I definitely do this is where I don't every time I wear a woolen item I don't wash it every time I wear it because if I've got a t-shirt on underneath or whatever it it doesn't need washing all the time and obviously it fades the colours it's not that environmentally friendly it's not necessary because wool doesn't smell and so it doesn't look dirty I won't wash it every time I wear it and I know a lot of people are like that I mean socks yeah but a cardigan, no, I'm not going to wash it every time I wear it. So only put clean stuff basically back in your wardrobe, get in there and vacuum it regularly. And ideally don't store your knitwear directly onto the carpet, even if it's not a carpet that moths will eat. They prefer wool carpets. I'll come back to wool carpets in a little bit. So the other interesting thing that I didn't realise until I started researching the little buggers is the clothes moth don't, the moths, when they're actually a moth flying around that I'm I'm going around killing all the time, like the minute I see a moth, it's dead. You don't get any second chances. I allowed a house spider, and it was a very large one, called Dave to live in my kitchen for months, even though it kept crawling out and crawling at me until it eventually just died of starvation, I think, um, in the middle of the rug. Like, I'll let the spiders stay, but not the moths. They have to be dealt with. And I do kill them straight away if I see any. But it don't matter because they don't eat the flipping clothes, right? It's the little larvae, the pre-moth that eats the clothes. So the clothes moth doesn't have mouth parts that can chew through the clothes. Only the larvae can, right? Which wouldn't be that bad if they weren't like a millimetre when they were larvae, right? You can hardly bloody see them. You're not going to see them in a dark wardrobe. This is why they get away with murder. 
ruining people's knitwear, right? So the only way to stop them is one, to stop the, the moth kind of laying their eggs in the first place. And they can lay up to 300 eggs in one sitting. I mean, that is like, sh- you know, pretty shrewd work, really. 300 bloody eggs. No wonder the stuff gets chewed to bits in about 10 minutes. But the only way to stop the little larvae, like one millimetre larvae, getting into your knitwear is a physical barrier. Although we're very used to using plastic tubs and stuff for this, um, it's recommended that you don't for knitwear because it can make them mouldy and instead use a breathable bag and consider or a box but not a cardboard box because the larvae can eat that as well and consider putting some silica sachets or something like that in there to reduce any moisture if there is any moisture that's left over in there um adult moths can be repelled by strong aromas as well so if there are no adults, there are no larvae, right? So if we can get rid of them, then they don't even lay stuff in the first place. So the usual suspects like lavender, rosemary, laurel, um, cedar. I've bought some cedar blocks to put in my wardrobe once I've finished fumigating the place. Uh, patchouli is another one that you can use that will repel the adult moths. Now, moths breed all year round, but they're most prevalent between June and October. And... As I said, the female ones can lay up to 300 eggs. I've seen different numbers between 100 and 300. Like one is too many, frankly, but up to 300 at a time. And the larvae take two to nine months to mature into a moth. So that is a lot of munching time, isn't it? A lot of munching time. Um, Clothes moths are not very good flyers. So it's unlikely that they've flown in through a window and it's much more likely that stuff will be brought in from somewhere else where they've been contaminated. Vintage clothing is a big kind of vector, I guess, for the clothes moths. Um, So any antiques, antique rugs, for instance, are also quite high transit area for them um secondhand shop vintage finds so just make sure that you are anything you do get that has been somewhere else first where there's a likelihood that it could be contaminated is to give it a really good kind of onboarding sequence of cleaning it and um making sure that there there's no infestation before you introduce it to your lovely wardrobe the same goes for yarn. If you're getting de-stash, de-stash I'm turning to Sean Connery again, de-stash yarn um, or any other yarn, do put it into the freezer uh, for a minimum of 48 hours to make sure that you kill any eggs and larvae because that will kill them. So that is one of the ways to get rid of them. So when you're deep cleaning your wardrobe, get everything out of there, wash all of the clothes um, if you can wash them. Wash them on high if you can wash it on high because that is another reason why we're getting more infestation now is that we wash our clothes on lower temperatures because it's more energy efficient and better for the environment but that doesn't kill the eggs so they're still there. So wash it on high if you can. If you can't then you can dry clean it or steam clean it if you can't dry clean it and you have access to a steam cleaner. Um, And what you want to do is pull all of that out and give your wardrobe a good clean. So hoover it all out and then you want to be looking for signs of any infestation. So you might see little eggs, tiny eggs. Some of them are are too small. The worms, the larvae look a little bit like a grain of rice, like every other pest. So have a look for that. And any cocoons, particularly in the corners um, where things don't get moved is where you're going to find them if you see them at all. So give it a super good hoover and then give it a wipe down and clean with a damp cloth with detergent on it. Um, You can use antibac or you can use white vinegar diluted with water. I love white vinegar for cleaning. It's brilliant. It does everything. You can clean everything with white vinegar um, and get it in bulk on eBay. My house does smell like a chippy. like creating the whole environment where the yarn smells vinegary the house smells vinegary everything is vinegary i love vinegar so if you can't dry clean it or wash it or even if you can but you've got the space put them in put your knitwear and your clothing that is likely to be chewed into a freezer a chest freezer is great especially a commercial one because they go really low temperatures um, but put them in for at least 48 hours, which will kill and eat legs, eggs and larvae for you. 
Another thing you can do is to spread out the clothes in your wardrobe to get more ventilation because that also prevents the larvae from crossing over from one item to another. And also they don't really like ventilation. They like nice, stuffy, warm, dark corners in which to breathe. You can also use anti-moth paper. Um, sachets, repellents, like we talked about a little bit earlier, from cedarwood, lavender. Eucalyptus is another one. I love the smell of eucalyptus. I think it smells really clean and really nice, so that's a good option. Um, if you're using cedar blocks, then if they lose their smell, you can sand them down a little bit and add some more red cedar oil to bring the smell back again. And lavender sachets, obviously you can use lavender scented detergents if you want to, or linen water. Again, going a little bit old school, but quite often that smells of lavender and that can actually help keep keep the moths down by preventing them from wanting to be there in the first place. Now, when it comes to storing your out-of-season clothes, clean them, store them properly. Um, any valuable clothes, any you know expensive 100% wool or 100% cashmere or whatever else, then you're going to want to put them into storage bags. Um, not the plastic ones because plastic ones, especially the dry cleaning ones, um, attract dust and dust is food for the moths. And um, get rid of those, but get proper protective bags that you can pack your out of season clothes away into. Again, get some lavender in there as well. And hopefully that will keep them out of there. You can get lidded boxes as well. Um or vacuum bags is another option. And you can even get cedar chests if you if you know where to find them. It's an entire box made of cedar to store knitwear in. As I mentioned before, make sure you deep clean any vintage finds before you put them in your wardrobe. And if you have moths in your carpets, if you've got wool carpets at home, where you will find them will be in the low traffic areas, so around the edges near the skirting boards. Um, if it was the stairs, for instance, they'd be on the edges by the skirting boards, they wouldn't be in the middle. And you'll notice that they just chew big lines into the carpet. I don't have the, car the any problems with that because it's pro polypropylene, I guess plastic carpet came with the house um and yeah that is like the best way to sort of get rid of them is clean it make sure all your clothes are clean if you get an infestation remove them all from the wardrobe hoover it wipe it with a detergent or white vinegar clean it all off so there's nothing left in there clean all of the clothes freeze them if you can and um, make sure that it's well ventilated and you put some preventative measures in there like your lavenders, your cedar blocks and all that kind of good stuff. It might well be that even if you do all that, they still come back. But if you do all of that, the chances are that you are going to spot any problems before they become a Swiss cheese, holy merino base layer and um, they don't get to the good stuff and get to your knitwear. So there, that's it. That's what I've got now got on my list of stuff to do. And oh, I've got so much stuff in there. I've got like dry clean only silk dresses. I've got wool blazers. Oh, I've got all of the knitwear that I need to hand wash. Yeah, it's a big job. But I've got my clean piles. So my stuff that's been out of them, been laundered and cleaned is in, a, on, in another pile, another part of the room. Um, So that I can keep that separate. So yeah. If you wish to commiserate me for my getting moths in my clothes, then please, please feel free to make their, their noises and tell me how it's all going to be fine. And if you've got any other tips, especially if you are um, not in the UK, if you're in other countries where there are more moths or different kinds of moths or you treat them in different ways, um, let me know and we can add in all of the good, good stuff and top tips to make sure that our stashes and our knitwear and our base layers all remain safe and if anyone is in Aldi and notices the skiing stuff's back in you let me know so I can go and get a new one so yeah that's all I've got time for this week I hope you enjoyed the misery that has been this show and got some helpful tips out of it at my expense at least because you know bad things happen but at least if we can all learn from it then we've got something out of it so I hope you will have a lovely week Happy crafting, and I will speak to you all again soon. Cheers! You've been
been listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes for this episode can be found on the blog at shinybees.com forward slash 165. Don't forget to come along and join our hashtag delicious little joys knit along that's taking place in the Shiny Bees podcast community. And again, you can join that by going to shinybees.com forward slash community and that will redirect you to our mighty network. Wow. I need a friend. I need your